Sunday morning. Some people are out there probably having breakfast with their families, probably preparing a nice day with the family at the mall, at the parks. However, some people are currently serving a life sentence inside of a California prison. We have Bobby on the phone. Robert Glenn, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. A little hot up here in uh, Sacramento, but, you know, Hopefully, uh, pretty soon, I'll be transferring back down south, get closer to my family, and be able to try to get some visits, you know? You know, uh, you know, Bobby, um, no disrespect right there, my friend, but the way you responded, it sounded like you were a little um, maybe sad, maybe something's been bothering you. You sound kind of a little upset. You don't sound in the, in the best of spirits right there, my friend. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's just I really don't like this prison, you know, every day. It's just drama so like i said the one thing that keeps me out of trouble is being able to visit with my family my wife you know so it takes a toll on everybody i don't care who you are you could be the most positive person but unless you're getting you know what you look forward to then you know it'll get it does get you down sometimes you know oh i can imagine man i can imagine man um Hopefully you do get your transfer soon there, buddy, so you can be closer to your family. Yep, 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 hopefully. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into this, man. I got a, I got an interesting right. topic, right. interesting conversation. Yeah. It's, uh, it has, it's happened to do with murders, man, people who are capable of yeah. killing. You know, I've always been interested yeah. in the fact of how some people are born with that natural instinct, Bobby. Some people are just natural born killers. They have it in them where they can take it to the next level and take someone's life and literally sleep soundly at night. It, it wouldn't even bother him. It wouldn't affect him in any type of way to take someone's life. However, there's some people who have been put in those compromising situations. There's been people who have snapped and, and, and just made a mistake. So I've always been interested in how people can take it to the next level. You know, their characters, their personalities, what makes them tick. Have you came across um, interesting individuals who you probably didn't see it, that they had it in them. However, they were straight cold killers. Yeah, you know, and, and, yeah, that's an interesting question. And I was thinking about some stuff the other day that you know me and you were talking about, and like there's some, there's like let's say three different types of people who do stuff like that, right? So you'll have the one type. Like, let me use my old Sally as an example, Steve Oliveira from Antica, right? When I when I first moved in with him up to help stay, like immediately, like you can just see in his eyes that there's just something not right about him. He's just like you just get that feeling that he's evil, you know. And that guy, he was, you know. I remember, like up there in Pelican Bay, when you get validated, you get an inter, you get an indeterminate shoot term, and when you go to committee, they actually tell you that there's only two ways you're getting out of here. Either you debrief or you die. So that's always been a, the common theme that everybody believed up there in Pelican Bay, you know? And it's true. There, that was the only two ways to get out of Pelican Bay. But Steve-O, he, he came up with a third way. He said, you know what, we come up with a third option. We'll just start killing our cellies. And we'll just go up to the row. We'll get the death penalty. We'll go up to the row. We'll get treated better. We'll get better privileges. We'll get phone calls, better food, better better everything. And so it, that right there, it kind of like, it struck me as, as, you know, that's not cool. There ain't no honor in that. Killing somebody just so you can get a better, go to a better place to get treated, you know? So that right there just struck me as that's not that kind of that's kind of one of the first things that opened my eyes to that whole gang thing, you know. Like, like when you're first coming up in the gang, they try to 
teach you all that honor and loyalty and you know so if i've you know the things that i've done in the past i like to be able to look at myself in the mirror and you know be proud of myself of for the things that i've done i mean i don't know if you can be proud of actually taking somebody's life but you know i didn't kill somebody over a 20 dollar drug debt or a or, you know, a little slight, like he bumped into me. I didn't do something like that, you know. And then you have another type of inmates, like let's say me, for example. You know, when I was on the streets, I wasn't preying on society. You know, all my crimes were property crimes, most of them anyways. You know, and I came to prison for, or when I, when I came back to prison in 1995, I came back for an auto burglary. I was in the L.A. County Jail, and I ended up killing no brains, right? So, yeah, I've always despised sex offenders, you know, just child murderers, things like that. So my my whole thing back then was that – go ahead. My whole thing back then was that, that murder was – in a, you know, a big part of it was that I despised them, but also a big part of it was if I didn't kill that dude, they were going to kill me, you know, because that's kind of how it is when you're in the gang. You have a you have a rule. There's a certain way to do things, you know, child workers. In, you can't fight them. They don't have that coming. You don't beat up a child. You don't beat up. Uh, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You either stab them and kill them, or, you know, that's it. Or they're going to kill you. So I knew that if I ended up getting that guy beat up, or and that's kind of, a, you know, a lot. It's interesting because a lot of these new guys, they'll do things. Like, let's say somebody's going to go on a mission, and they tell someone to go kill someone. What that guy will do is he'll end up dropping a kite to the cops, you know, hey, look, this guy's going to be murdered, just to hurry up and get him out of there. You know, so you see that a lot. They'll hurry up and try to get a guy transferred so they won't have to kill a guy, you know. But also, so there's a third type of uh, inmate, too, and this is the one I was thinking about the other day, where a lot of these murders that happen in prison, the majority of them, the majority of them aren't like one day a guy just sees a chomo or sees a and he just goes out and he kills them. Like there's all kinds of people like that. And so that's not happening. But what happens is this this third type of individual is that he's in trouble himself, right? And so he's afraid. Fear is a is a huge um motivation right there you know when someone has done something wrong you know he owes money for drugs or you know he was supposed to do something he never did it and so it's either his head or somebody else's head on a chopping block and they give that guy an opportunity to go ahead and fix what you've done by doing this he'll choose that option you know, and so that's kind of that third individual right there. They're motivated by fear. You know, so I see this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You know, just the other day there was a guy out on the yard where, you know, he wasn't liking this this prison. He wanted to get out of here. He owed money, and so he went out to the yard, and he just took off on the first offender he saw. You know. He didn't stab him, but it was enough to, like, get him off the yard. So, you know, that's that third type of individual, though. They kill not because they're born to kill, or they kill not because of, like, some hatred for the person and his crimes, but they kill out of fear, you know. They kill just because they, they're they going to be killed. You understand what I'm saying? A hundred percent. A hundred percent, Bobby. Going back, going back to that first type of individual who you said that that they they're capable of taking someone's life, viciously killing someone, and, and I imagine inside a prison, it's it, it's intimate. It's not you're doing it from a mile away. It's it's physical. You're you're having to look the person in the eye almost. So it's it's a lot more harsh. You know, do you know of someone who's actually 
killed someone just to get sent to death row, just to have these privileges. Yeah, I, I think, um, I believe, actually I know for a fact that Phantom, Galvan, he killed Robbie Johnson because he was trying to get to death row. You know, when I seen uh, Phantom over on 4B Yard in Corcoran, that that was his thing. He was talking about it. He didn't want to do the rest of his life out here on the line. I think his I think his idea has changed since then, from then until now. But that was his whole mindset back then was to kill somebody so that he can get the death penalty and he can go to the role. And when he killed, I don't know if I'm correct in this, but from what I've heard. He wasn't given a death penalty for killing Robbie Johnson. He wasn't even, they weren't giving him the death penalty for killing Robbie. What ended up happening is that he was going to court, and when he came back to court one day, they had rolled the transportation van up to the yard, to the building, and when the cop went around and opened the door, he ended up stabbing that cop, right? A couple times, two or three times from what I heard. Well, that automatically is a death penalty case. Attempts for murder on a cop? Oh, yeah, you're done. You know? So, besides yeah, I know a Phantom. few guys. Huh? What, Be, what about besides besides Phantom, besides uh, Bob, uh, besides uh, Robert Gavan? Do you know anybody else? Well, um, I know, um, no, not really to get the death penalty. Like, you got those guys that killed Yogi. In New Folsom, remember, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you heard about it, the two white boys that were uh, A.B., they killed uh, Yogi a couple weeks after he was released from Pelican Bay Shoe. Um, and this is after the peace treaty, get... right? It started to cut you off. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this was, the, uh, this was after the peace treaty, but they've been trying to get Yogi for decades you know he's been in the shoe all this time and they have been trying to kill that guy for a long time i remember even when i was back there in the shoe they were telling me about him like yeah this is because you know we have a hit list of people that you know were supposed to kill on site and he was one of those guys you know people are now trying to say that you know all the cops orchestrated it they were trying to have him killed because he killed a cop he killed a corrections officer i think he killed like two i think i've heard about it but that wasn't why the brothers were trying to kill him the brothers were trying to kill him because one he he had ended up taking uh brothers um clavo dope and visiting when they were out there on the line 30 40 years ago but the main thing was that he was a pervert. He was busted for, I think he had a pimping and pandering case. He was pimping out some little girl, you know, and he ended up disrespecting the brothers. And so, yeah, that dude was done, you know. And Steve, you know, you know, when I was telling you about, when I was telling you about my old Sally, um, when he, when he was my Sally, that was his thinking, right? And, you know, going back to what we were talking about, how you can just see it where people are just like, they have that in them. You know, there was, when I first sailed up with that guy, this was in like 96, he had just orchestrated. You have 60 seconds remaining. Hey, I'm going to call you back. Yes, sir. All right, all right. Talk to you, man. Okay. All right, bye. All right, so I know I've, I know I've talked about that, that, um, dead eye case before where the dead eye had killed my homeboy up there. So this is in nineteen ninety six. Right? In the late nineties, they had killed like thirteen, fourteen people up there in Pelican Bay. Right? So when I had moved in with Steve O, um, he had just orchestrated or was involved in orchestrating that whole murder of having Dead Eye, that Healy guy, kill Art Ruvo, you know, they made a batch of wine, they spiked the wine with some psych meds. Once he got to drinking, he started getting tired. Dead Eye jumped on his back, wrapped his legs around his waist, his arms around his neck, and he killed him, you know. Then he called the cop in the tower, 
and told him to open do- open the door to get this dead piece of shit out of here, you know. And and that's what got him in trouble also is by him saying that. But immediately after he killed Rufo, he rolled. He turned federal witness. He, they did a RICO indictment, and he was the main testifying witness and all that. And when he went to court and got sentenced, he didn't get no time for killing Rufo. Whatever time he got for killing Art Rufo was ran concurrent with the current time that he was with the time that he was already currently doing. You know, so it's kind of weird. But so Steve-O, when I moved in with him, it was automatically a, a, a dislike from him to me, from me to him, because. He knows that I'm Rufo's homeboy, that Rufo's the one that raised his hand for me, that brought me in. Me, I know that he had something to do with having my homeboy killed, so we already didn't like each other. But there was nothing I can do, right? If I tried to kill Steve-O, I'm automatically, that's like signing my death warrant right there. They're going to kill me. You can't do that. You can't kill a brother. You know, so I stuck it out. I tried to tough it out when he was... That was when you try to get in the gang. What what they do is you got to do a two year probationary period. You got to sell up with a brother for two years, and he's kind of got to run you through the ringer to see if you got what it takes. And they'll be a little hard on the youngsters, you know. But so what he would do is when me and him would work out every day, he would try to do these little things like, hey, you know, I want to try to do some bench presses. And what we'll do is we'll make a little bench press um, on the floor coming out like a T from where the bunk is because the bunks go um, along the back wall. So he made a little bench coming out like a T where you would lay down on. And then he would, what he said he wanted to do is what I want to do is I want to tie the sheet around one foot and then we'll tie the sheet around your other foot that way when you get up on top of the bunk and I can grab your feet I could bench you and the sheet is supposed to help keep your legs from spreading apart can you understand that I'm I'm literally trying to visualize it, as you said, but I think I have a good uh, idea of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to explain, but you know, if you get up on top of somebody and and they're you're they're benching you like a weight, the the sheet that's tied to one foot and the other, it's about maybe let's say um, the sheet's three feet long, so that'll keep all the pressure. It'll keep your from your legs going out wide, and you're able to bench a person that way. So immediately, I thought, hell no, I'm not letting you tie up my my feet. you got to be crazy. <laughs> but so I told him, kind of like, look, man, you know what we'll do is we'll tie a sheet in a circle. We'll make a loop, and then I can slide one foot through one end, the other foot through the other loop, and that'll work just the same, you know. So there was a couple little things like that that he had, he had tried to do that I had picked up on, you know. But So eventually, I'll give it maybe six months later, he was going back and forth to court for a for a weapons case that he picked up in New Folsom. And um, I went out to a shower one day. And when I went out to the shower, um, the cop had shut the door and opened up the pod door and went in there and searched my cell. So after the cell search, my shower was done. They opened up my shower door, and I started to go back home. Well, a cop calls me to the rotunda door, yeah, I, and I tell him, yeah, what's up? He's like, hey, look, when you go back home, push that string back inside your cellie's TV. And I, I'm looking at him kind of weird, you know. And I tell him, what are you talking about? He's like the green string that's hanging out of your cellie's TV, push it. I said, dude, what the, what green? He's like the green string that's tied to the knife. I said, okay, whatever. So I go back home, and sure enough, my cellie's got this uh, white Trinitron TV, and there's a green string hanging out of it. So I 
I pull on the string and kind of like open up the side of the TV with my fingers and pull it out, pull it apart a little bit to where enough to where I can get that out, whatever's in there, whatever the string's tied to, and out comes a, a shank, right? He never told me he had a shank. There's only one reason why you don't tell your cell you, you got a piece, and that's because you're, you're going to end up using it on him, you know? Like, that's a huge rule right there. That's a huge no-no. You do not do that. And so I told that cop, um, I told him, hey, man, uh, let me talk to you real quick. You know, And also I didn't realize, I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know if he was trying to, like, set him up, set me up. You know, so I told him, look, man, I don't know what the fuck you're doing, but I don't want no part of it. You know, so he said, all right, fine. He goes, just go ahead and pack your silly stuff and I'll put it in the closet until he comes back from court. And so he did. But he he was right there because once he once he got my cellie's property, he wrote it up. Not only did he write it up as a 115, but he called the district attorney in in um um New Folsom where he was going to court and he told him that Steve-O had just been caught with a weapon inside his cell in Pelican Bay, you know, so it's like he's straight, like, he what, he what he put on the report is that he was transpacking. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. He was transpacking Steve-O's property, and he noticed that there was a missing screw, and upon further inspection, he's seen a inmate manufactured weapon. So he lied, you know? And that's kind of what started me being in the hat with the brothers, that right there. Because they were trying to pull me back to, they were trying to pull me out to court. He was trying to pull me out to court. And I was like, look, man, I don't want, I'm going home in a, in, in a year, you know? So, but I, I tried to, I tried to say, I, I said all this to tell you that the next Sally that moved in with Steve-O after me, he ended up, he ended up, the, the, hold on a second, I got an alarm right now, everybody has to get down. Oh, down, did they say, did they say why? A little riot going off um, or something? They, nah, they did a, they did a, it's a cold too, so I think it's a fight. Oh, fight! Oh. Yeah, I think it's just a yeah, just a mutual comment. This is Mule Creek. There ain't a lot of uh, that going on. But so I was telling you all that to tell you that the very next Sally that moved in with Steve-O was a homeboy named Spun, and Spun went to sleep one night. That dude Spun didn't do nothing wrong, man. He didn't have no smut on him. He didn't do nothing, and Steve-O killed him in the in the middle of the night while he was sleeping, you know. And immediately after killing him, he dropped out. So like you killed that dude for nothing. Like why though? You kill him. I don't know. the The original plan, his plan, was to kill him to get out of Pelican Bay shoe to get to the row. But see, this is you know also going on at the time was. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Todd Asker. Absolutely. He was part of the hunger strike. This call strike. and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. All right. Well, he's in that right now, too. Did you ever hear about that? I heard something similar. However, I keep hearing both things. I keep hearing that he's not in the hat. Then I hear that he is in the hat. So I haven't been able to get a an accurate answer. Oh, he's in the hat. He got, he. got You know, I give that dude credit because he's the reason why everybody got cut loose out of the shoe in like 2015. It's because of him, because he filed the lawsuit and and he won it, you know, because of the hunger strike and all of that. So he was in um, Kern Valley. He got all spun out on that ketamine, and he got paranoid thinking that they were going to kill him, and he locked it up. After he came out, he came down from the meth, he told the cops, hey, it's all good, go ahead and let me back out. And they said, no, we can't let you back out. You you know, 
like it's their job to protect all inmates, even from themselves. And they, and hey, and they will kill that dude if they ever eventually let him. Because you can't do that, no matter if you're a brother or not. Like he, he locked it up. He's got something coming for that, and they will kill him. You know. So the last time I seen him. He was in Kern Valley fighting it, and they were talking about putting him up there in uh, RCGP, where I was at, up there in Pelican Bay, you know. But so during during the time, this was also, too, that Steve-O had, had he made this um, dart gun, and there was this black guy who was coming by the cell to get take a shower, and Steve-O shot him, and, like, missed the heart by like a centimeter or something, you know. So he had that case going on, but Todd was involved in his own case. Todd was, Todd had came out to get supplies one day up there in Pelican Bay, and the Norteños, and the Norteños uh, had popped their door. And they came out, and they tried to stab him. Well, the cop shot Todd in the hand, Right. And so Todd had filed a lawsuit for, um, he sued for poor medical neglect or something, but he also sued CDC for the people that built the prison because there was a defect in those doors in Pelican Bay, which allowed inmates to, um, in the back of the door, they have like this uh, little notch cut out, right? And so when the door is open or the door is shut, this metal bar drops down into that notch and it keeps the door from being able to open it. So what inmates would do is they would take these toothbrushes that they give us, they would cut them down, they would shove them in that little notch, make it flush so when the door was shut, that not, that metal bar wouldn't be able to drop down into the notch and lock it. That's how inmates were able to pop them. And so because of this lawsuit, uh, Todd had one you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And he sent, you know, Steve-O a good chunk because they were crimeys. So now Steve-O is flush with cash. So I think his whole um, attitude on death row changed. So now his whole motivation is, now I need to spend this money and I need to get someplace where I could spend it. Let me go ahead and just get out of the shoe. That way I'll be able to have more action at drugs, you know, four packages a year, fat canteen, all that. And I think that's why he did what he did, you know. You have 60 seconds remaining. He dropped out right after that, you know. Did you end, or end hey, up... Uh, can you call back? Let me go ahead and call you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So why did Steve-O end up dropping out? Say it again? Did you ever get word of why Steve-O dropped out? Um, I think, well, see, here's the thing about Steve-O, all right? When Steve-O dropped out, he came to Mule Creek, and he, I don't know how to say it. I don't want to be disrespectful because I'm really respectful towards people, you know, that are, um, like, let's say, the homosexuals in prison. I'm, I'm, even though I don't swing that way, I'm real respectful of everybody, regardless of what they do. But when Steve-O dropped out, he turned into a big old <laughs> home. Like, that was his his thing right there was he was chasing them punks, you know? And, like, I, I'll give you two, like, little quick stories. Um, there's a homeboy named Edge that got here also. And Edge is one of the one. Edge is the one that there's a video circulating on the internet of two white boys stabbing a guy up in Pelican Bay. They were wearing rain slickers, and the one guy was doing pull-ups. And as he did his pull-ups, the other two white boys started stabbing him. I know exactly what video you're talking about. It, 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 it really, it really did go viral. The one that were then yeah, the raincoats. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's Edge. One of those guys is Edge. Well, when Edge, Edge had a lot of love for Steve-O, and he looked up to him. So when Edge got to Mule Creek, he was following Steve-O around like a lost puppy dog, you know. 
he idolized him. You know, that's his big homie, you know. But one day, um, Steve-O tells Edge, hey, keep pointing real quick. So Edge is thinking that Steve-O is going to go in the cell and, like, stab somebody, you know. Well, Edge said that he would heard some slapping coming from the cell, and so he went over there and he looked in there, and Steve-O was in there, you know, engaged in activity with that punk, and he said, oh, hell no. So he, from that day on, he tried to distance himself from Steve-O, and Steve-O ended up dropping a kite to get Edge and another white boy out of here, right? And then also... When Steve-O was here, the white boys, he had heard that the white boys were talking about him, and Steve-O is sick. Like, he's just, like I said, he's got that killer, that mentality where there's just something off. And so Steve-O, man, he makes, oh, he's one of the guys that makes the baddest weapons ever, like, ever, I've ever seen. Like, there's a couple guys that could, that can claim that title, but his weapons, like he'll cut a piece of the door or he'll cut a piece of the locker, and he will sharpen, he will sharpen that thing to where it's like chrome, like you would think that it was bought in a store. Like that's how good they are. And so he came out to the yard one day, and he approached those white boys out on the yard, and he lifted up his shirt and he had a couple shanks, and he said, "What's up? Does anybody got a problem?" And everybody was like, no, Steve, oh, man, we ain't got no problem. Hey, do whatever you're going to do, you know. But that's like, that's, you know, Pincushion used to do that. He's dead now. But that was his kind of, his thing is that he would come out with two weapons and he would throw one at your feet and tell, pick it up and deal with it. Or This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And most people, when they're confronted with that type of situation where, you know, somebody's throwing a knife at your feet and if you pick it up, you know that he's just going to start burying that other one in your neck or your head. Like, you know, that's enough to <laughs> tell most of these guys, man, I don't want no problems, you know. But so, yeah, Steve-O ended up, um, he's dead now. He got some kind of uh, um, infection in his brain and he died. I remember the guys were telling me in Lancaster when they pulled him out of a cell, he was all stiff, like, you know. But So I think that was his, I think that was his main, because he was never in the hat. He never did anything wrong. So I think his main motivation was he was tired of sitting back in the shoe for, I don't know, he'd probably been in there for, like, going on 15 years. He got that money from Todd. And he likes guys, you know. So, I mean, I've seen I've seen guys get into it with their wives, and they they drop out because their relationship's falling apart. So I can understand it if he wants, you know, that kind of companionship, and he's not getting it where he's at, and he can't get it where he's at because he knows that he'll be killed, he'll be targeted for murder if they find out he's. You can't be being a gang. You know, so there's all those things right there that I think that's why he did it, you know. You, you've you actually seen people drop out because of their wives? Probably giving him an yeah. ultimatum? Like, hey, leave that life or I'm leaving you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. I know a lot of people. Jeff Scott from Sacramento, his wife told him, you know, you've been putting in work all these years for the homies. When's it my time? When are you going to, you know, do something for me? And all she wanted was... See, Jeff Scott, he got put in the hat because he was over there in, in New Folsom, and one of those yards was a no-good yard, a 90-day yard. You had 90 days to get off that yard. And if you stayed on that yard for 91 days, you were in the hat. Well, Jeff had a family visit coming. I'll get it. It's sensible order. So Jeff had a family visit come, and he stayed for his family visit to give that to his wife, and that was it. He was put in the hat. So they stabbed him in um, Corcoran. He had did something to get off that yard. When he went to the back, he tried to explain the situation, but they just put him in the hat. And when he got to Corcoran, they stabbed him. Mickey had him stabbed. Mickey told him, all right, it's all good. That was just, you know, a hard check. That was your discipline for what you got coming. 
go ahead and come back out, and you're fine. And he fell for it. All white boys are suckers like that. They, he, fell, he went back out, and they stabbed him again, you know? Hey, let me, uh, let me call you back. They're doing day room recall right now, so I'm going to call you from my tablet. Okay, okay. You were actually telling me about a different type of killer. Can you go ahead and elaborate yeah. on that, please? Yeah, yeah. So I was I was thinking about people who kill not because they're born that way, born killers, or they're made that way as a product of, of their environment, but they kill to, like, cover up a crime. So, like, a lot of these guys in prison now, they, everybody knows about DNA evidence. I mean, they're they're catching people based on familial DNA. So if if somebody commits a crime and their one of their nieces or great granddaughters or something registers on that 23andMe, they'll be able to track you down through that you know familial DNA. Someone who's related, they try to find someone in your family tree that's a certain age to fit that year that the crime was committed. So like let's say that guy Gardner, right? He was in prison for a offense, right? I'm not sure the exact offense he was in prison for, but he he did his time and he got out. So when he got out, he did another crime. He kidnapped a little girl on her way to school. And he ended up killing her, right? So I don't. That wasn't his motive. His motive wasn't to kill her. His mo, his thing in his mind. I mean, he's still an evil, sick individual, but his whole motivation was the actual crime itself, and to try and keep from going back to prison, he killed her and he buried her body out there in San Diego in the, in the canyon. You know, and he did this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. He did that again with that jogger. He killed her and tried to bury her. Or let's say Richard Allen Davis. He was a pervert, right? He kidnapped Polly Class. His whole thing was the sex crime and he ended up killing that little girl. You know, and, and that's what you know. So I don't think those guys are are born killers. They're born perverted, you know, but then they're, they just try to cover up their crime, you know. What about the ones that are able to do the unthinkable to their parents, to their wives, to their husbands? Mm -hmm. What about those type of killers? Yeah, but, yeah, but see, a lot of those are motivated by greed, like the Menendez brothers. Was, that was a financial motivation right there. They did what they did because they wanted that money. There was I, I still to this day I don't believe that, you know, those kids were blue abused. I know they're trying to say that, but that's just because I think they're trying to get out of prison, but you know, or Scott Peterson, he killed his wife because he was having an affair. You know, so but these guys, they're not, they're not killers. They haven't been going around killing people. It's a, I guess what they call it is a crime of passion. You know? It's a one-time thing. You put these guys, you know, they kill their spouse or they kill their parents, you know, and they come to prison. Or let's say a, sh a school, sh that guy, Nicholas. You know, they'll come to prison and they will never commit another act of violence in their life. Scott Peterson ain't gonna do nothing to nobody. So if he was if he was that evil, then wouldn't it be like wouldn't they continue to do those acts of violence in prison? You know, you have a very good point right there. You have a very good point right there. What is your perspective? You know, Dahmer, on, on no, go ahead. I'm sorry. That guy, that guy, Jeffrey Dahmer, look at him, man. That guy, he was just sick. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was just killing people just, you know, that's what he got off on. Or that Green River Killer, what do they call him, BTK or whatever. Oh, not the BTK. The Green River Killer was the one that was picking up prostitutes for all those years and having them and killing them and... With him, it was different, so I think he got off not only on the 
but also on the murder, you know. That other guy you mentioned, uh, BTK, he's another sick puppy. That guy was twisted. I think he was a pastor in church, uh, Bobby. This guy was actually a pastor Which one in church or something like that. BTK, I think he was at a Wichita. He, he was the one that was blind, torture, and kill, uh, BTK. And he would literally oh, kidnap yeah, people yeah. and torture them. And he would tease the cops. He would call into the newspaper. He'd be like, what do I got to do to to get a newspaper, write an article? Who do I have to kill? Like, this guy was twisted. Yeah, he was the white guy. Yeah, yeah, so that was, yeah, the white guy. So that was his whole thing, though. He was giving off on torturing women. Like, that's sick right there. That's evil. You are born that way. There is something wrong with you, you know? There's a couple other guys in California who, remember the ones where they were taking women up there to like these this little, he had like a, a dungeon that he built underground and he would torture women? I think I, think I know exactly I think he, what you're talking about. He created chambers I, I think, and devices and whatnot. Yeah, I think he's on death row right now. It's a Chinese guy. He had a white guy as a crime partner. The white guy killed himself. And the Chinese guy or Asian guy, he's on death row, I think. What's that other cat, that that one that was around here in the Los Angeles area? Uh, uh, what's his name? Ray, Ray Melendez? No, what's his name? The one that used to uh, have the pentagram on, on his hand, like he's the devil worshiper with the long hair and a lot of girls went crazy over him. What's his name? I can't believe I forgot his oh, name. Yeah. Richard Ramirez. Who, the night stalker? The night stalker. Exactly. Yeah, the night stalker though, he wasn't, um, murder wasn't his thing. He was just into in women. He was, yeah, he had L.A. like on one because that was a huge thing. Everybody was afraid. He would go around creeping into people's houses and, you know. And those types of people, um, what is their... Uh how do inmates interpret them inside of prison? Are they embraced? Are they uh, left alone? No. Oh, hell no. Like, I can't even understand. I, I just found out the other day that, no, no, all those people are pariahs. Like, you know, some people will slide up close to them to try and, um, you know, they're like one of those fish in the sea that they, like bottom feeders, right? And so these guys will slide up close and try to befriend them because some of these guys got money, like the Menendez brothers, and they'll, you know, they'll get something out of them, you know? But no, man, I, I cannot stand people like that. There's a guy over there right now I heard in Mule Creek over on B Yard, the guy that had all those children and he kept them locked up in their room. He had like 13 kids. You're talking about, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about the case out of Paris where they were chained up. Yeah. Yeah, so I heard, I'm not sure if they were chained, but I heard he's here now, and I oh, hope in one of these days, yeah, I hope one of these days somebody over there on B Yard is just having a bad day and just owes some money or something. I can't believe he's allowed to live another day, you know, go to the store or get a food sale or call his family, you know, after the way he treated those kids. You, you know, that that's that's another thing about these uh, uh, food sales. You would come to think that cer uh, certain people would be disqualified from, from being able to, to, you know, get these sales. You know, being able to eat Pan Experience, barbecue, uh, peaks, uh, I think that's a privilege. And, the, and some of these sick people should not have these privileges. They should not have tablets and being able to uh, text all day and watch movies and, and whatnot. They should not be able to. Certain people yeah. in society should not have those privileges, I feel. Yeah, I mean, look at right now. Like, I was out there and, I mean, we... Yeah, we have it so good. Like, I was out there talking to you on the on the phone in the day room, and I said, hold on, they're doing day room recall. Let me go call you for my cell. And I did. I came in my cell, picked up my tablet, and called you. Like, 
this is not prison anymore. I mean, I like it, but we do have it really good. And I agree with you that some of these people shouldn't be allowed to be, have that luxury, you know. But then where do you draw the line? Because there's some people out there that believe that I shouldn't have this luxury, that no inmate should have this luxury, that all inmates should be on a chain game doing hard labor every day, you know. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, Bob. You have a, a, yeah. a good point there. But if it were up to me, people that that have yeah. this perverted uh, activity, they should be locked down twenty three and one, no privileges, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. They do that though. You know, people who are busted for crimes, you know, they're not allowed to have family visits. They're not allowed to have those conjugal visits. You know, so there's certain things that they exclude them from because of that you know like working around uh, uh like having a job in prison that gives them access to like a computer or a phone or something you know 